Good afternoon, everyone. Um, appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to join uh, join us today. With we've got a great speaker lineup. Um, this is our third of maybe several more to come of virtual Zoom meetings with the MGMA. And uh, excited to have with us today SPMIC. A um, couple of announcements, real quick. If any hadn't heard, the this the state team GMA did officially cancel or postpone the fall conference that was slated for Memphis this fall in September, and so that has been canceled officially due to the continuing uh, concerns with the COVID. Um, so. No better time than now, I think, to, um, to welcome SVMIC as our presenters today. Um, Jackie Boswell will hit up uh, the in introductions and uh, inform everyone if you have questions, because this is definitely a hot topic and expect some good questions today from our audience. So definitely, uh, Jackie will explain what to do to uh, present your questions. And at the end of the, of the discussion, uh, she will coordinate uh, those those questions and answers. So, Jackie. Great, thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jackie Boswell, and I'm Assistant Vice President at SVMIC. I hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy as we continue dealing with the ongoing COVID situation. We're very excited to present this timely panel discussion to you today on safely managing stages of reopening during COVID-19. As we continue to deal with this evolving situation, it seems like every day is filled with new information that raises new challenges and questions, and we hope to address some of those for you today. Uh, before we begin, I would like to review a couple of items so that our webinar run smoothly today. We have a full agenda, but we'll attempt to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. If you would, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. If you can, also please wait until the, towards the end of the presentation so that we're not taking questions that have already be, been addressed. And if we run out of time for all of your questions, all of the panelists' contact information is at the end of the presentation. Uh, and you can direct any of those to us directly. It's my understanding that this webinar is being recorded so that you have access to it once it's available. Although some practices never closed, we know that many of you are in the process of reopening or at least considering steps in that direction. There's a lot of differences of opinion regarding those plans and I'm sure many of you have sat in on uh, different webinars and read different information on uh, on how to reopen. Wherever you are in this process, there's a few things that are that are quite certain at the moment. First of all, this is not over, uh, unfortunately, and it doesn't even seem close. Second, a return to normal will be a new normal for all of us. Finally, our goal today is not to return you to your pre-pandemic operations. Our goal is to outline the considerations in caring for both your patients and your employees as we work together through, through this challenge. To that end, let's go over the agenda for today. Ann Pontius, well, Gretchen will first open with some statistics for Shelby County, which many of you may be aware of, but she's researched the most recent statistics. And then Ann Pontius will review the elements of COVID transmission and discuss the CDC recommendations for dealing with, and OSHA recommendations for dealing with potential and positive COVID patients and employees in your practice. Sherry Smith will provide an overview of employment laws and regulations. We're getting a lot of questions uh, on how to deal with employees. Followed by Michael Cash, who will discuss the future of, trans of telemedicine as it relates to COVID, along with how you uh, should bill for telemedicine visits. And then Gretchen Napier will wrap us up 
with providing you some guidance on ways you can adjust practice operations to accommodate the uncertainty that staff may feel and uncertainty with your patients. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gretchen. Thanks, Jackie. So we wanted to just start out looking at what's actually happening in Shelby County right now. And so the good news is 9,146 people have recovered from COVID. The downside is that um, 222 people have passed away and there are still 4,487 4, cases still active. This gives us a, a good trend line to be able to see where the, the COVID began in March and we started to see the rise, but you guys did a great job of flattening that curve. And then as things began to reopen, you can see the line increasing toward the end of June and into July. Um, the last few days have looked pretty good with a, a downward trend. So hopefully you guys will be able to keep that up and be able to, to flatten that curve again. Next, we wanted to look at new deaths per day, which generally follow about two weeks after the new cases. And so you can see that spike here of 11 new deaths per day uh, at the end of June, um, but it's coming down since then, but still a, a lot of, of new deaths per day. And then the last chart we wanted to look at is really just a map of the hot spots in the Memphis area. And so you can see down by the Mississippi border, it's um, a pretty hot spot there. And just a, a note of mention, which you all may already know, but um, there's some hot spots uh, up across the border here toward the north as well. So I'm um, just looking at where the, the hotspots are in Memphis currently. So hopefully that uh, gives you a good idea of what's really happening in Memphis currently. And, um, you know, with the, the new changes that are happening on a daily basis from the government uh, and just people taking it more seriously, hopefully uh, those numbers will continue to improve. So uh, Anne, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Gretchen, and thanks, Jackie. Um, hello, everyone. Um, let's get started by understanding the infectious process. Um, you can, you can, you know, by understanding the infectious process, uh, you can then implement infection control measures to eliminate or minimize the spread of the virus. So um, there, there are these three required elements for somebody to develop an infection. Um, there has to be a source reservoir uh, for the virus, and humans and inanimate sources um, can house this SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. The human reservoirs, those being patients, the co-workers, uh, family members, any individual you or your staff come in contact with, um, and they can be obviously infected by showing symptoms or they could be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, which means they're not showing the symptoms yet, but they're still capable of transmitting the virus. Now, the inanimate objects where this virus is found includes all the surfaces in your practice, um, everything from out, whatever's out in your waiting room to everything that's in those exam rooms. Now, the second element for viral transmission is a susceptible host. And this is someone who's not currently infected, but will become infected or be a carrier. And whether or not that person becomes symptomatic is dependent on a complex relationship between the host and the infectious agent. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has proven it spans the scope of pathogenicity by not causing any symptoms at all um, in some individuals to causing death in normally healthy individuals. And we know there are human risk factors too that contribute to the virus's ability um, to create disease. And uh, you know, these factors can include a person's age, um, if they have comorbidities like diabetes or uh, other chronic conditions, or if they're immunocompromised for some reason. And the third element for infection transmission is the mode in which it is transmitted. Now, there are at least three modes of transmission. Um, there are droplets that contain the virus and they travel out of the host when somebody speaks, coughs, sneezes, um, or maybe they're having an aerosol producing procedure done. And these droplets can travel up to uh, six feet, but some of the virus will be airborne and that's our second mode of transmission. 
And this is when the virus is contained in very small particles that drift in the air currents um, or they can linger uh, in the air. Now droplets are the most likely mode of transmission and that's why social distancing has been set to be at at least six feet. Now just this week, the World Health Organization says that there is evidence that the airborne mode um, is also likely happening out there, but it's not the main mode of transmission, the droplets are. So when these droplets settle on something, then we have our third mode of transmission, um, and which is the direct contact with the virus on contaminated uh, surfaces like countertops and door handles. Yeah, you can think of gas pumps, groceries, ATM, keypads, or any other surface that you can think of. And once the virus is picked up, then people will self-deliver it to their eyes, their nose, their mouth, um, and then it has the potential to become an infection or they can transmit it to others, like with a handshake, which is another no-no for uh, 2020. Uh, or they can continue to contaminate more surfaces where it gets picked up by others. Now, air conditioning units are suspect for spreading the virus beyond social distancing of six feet. Um, through contact tracing, uh, they identified where one infected individual at a restaurant infected nine others that were beyond the six feet distance from the infected person. Um, but they, they realized, what they realized is that all of the newly infected patrons um, sat directly downwind of the infected person's exhale um, and there was an AC unit uh, over top of that infected person. And so that unit was responsible for forcing her infected droplets downstream beyond that six feet. So this is one of the reasons why authorities are encouraging outdoor activities. Now you need to think what you're going to do from a safety standpoint in your practice to protect your patients and also um, your employees. So you need to figure out um, what you're going to do to disrupt at least one of the three required elements for the transmission of the virus. So picture the virus being in the center of your exam room or your waiting room, or picture it being in the room you're in right now. Um, then there's something in each corner that you need to do to reduce your chance or others' chances of getting infected. So in that first corner, you can require your staff, or you need to require your staff and yourself to use proper PPE, and that's gonna be the minimum of the mask and eye, protect, eye protection, uh, washing your hands, not touching your face. Um, and in corner two, you train and you practice uh, cough and sneezing etiquette, remembering that the best way to cover a cough or a sneeze is with a tissue, and then you throw that away. But if that's not possible, then um, you definitely need to just bury your face in your elbow. Now in corner three is where you're going to disinfect um, and make sure that you follow the manufacturer's kill time instructions. So I've seen where these are anywhere from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. So you need to think about, are you gonna wait 10 minutes before rooming patients um, or between rooming patients? So you can check on the EPA website for disinfectants that destroy the SARS-CoV-2. Also here is where you're gonna properly remove contaminated items and potentially contaminated waste. Now in corner four, you wanna make sure that you're doing social distancing whenever possible at a minimum of six feet. And in a distance also minimize the time that you're having contact with individuals. And these are really the CDC recommendations of what you need to be doing. So we're doing these and we've been doing these and we need to continue to do these. As Jackie said, this is, this is not over. And so we've, we need to keep this up until this virus isn't threatening us anymore. Now, these are not all the precautions you should take, but they are the basics. Um, we know that each practice is unique and that you have to implement safety measures that are based on your own hazard assessment and the laws that require uh, implementation of safety measures. So that means OSHA. So OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and it has a big law that applies to your practice. It's called the General Duty Clause, and it is, it is a law, um, and if you don't adhere to it, it can cost you. 
So the general duty cause clause is it's it's overarching. I think of it as an umbrella and that it covers the entire practice. It states that as an employer, you have the responsibility to provide a safe work environment for your employees, one that is free from recognized hazards that cause or are likely to cause death or serious uh, physical harm. And the employees they too have to adhere to the OSHA rules, but they do that via your own safety policies. For employers to know what safety issues exist in your facility, you need to do a hazard assessment. And this is gonna identify the what, where, and when a hazard is present, and who is at risk of exposure to that hazard. And so now, with COVID-19, your assessment is really looking for those risks that are associated with the virus. So once the risks are identified, you need to then implement work practice controls to eliminate or minimize the risk. Now here with COVID-19, you know, the risk is coming in contact with people and that's your patients, your coworkers, you know, any visitors and you know, all of them. And also the type of procedures that you're doing, um, particularly if they are aerosol generating ones. Now the CDC makes recommendations to reduce the risk for your employees to get infected. And OSHA expects employers to implement these recommendations. And if you don't, um, you know, they may find themselves, or you may find yourself being cited under the general duty clause for not providing a safe work environment. environment. So I've given you some links here to several sites to assist you in determining what you should implement in your practice. Um, and these sites include uh, TOSHA, and it is a, it's, um, that's our Tennessee OSHA program, and mainly they mimic what the federal government is doing, but their site um, is pretty easy to navigate. Now, OSHA has a very detail-oriented site, but they have an excellent FAQ section, and with the CDC site, you almost need a, a compass and a navigator to get around it, but it, it does have um, all the information that you need to make decisions in safeguarding your practice, as well as how to deal with the situations when there's been an exposure, whether you suspect there's an exposure or there actually has been an exposure. And it also goes into details about when, how to go about um, bringing people back to work that have um, tested positive or have had an exposure. Um, just yesterday, they provided an update on their site about um, wearing eye protection and recognizing that the gaps between the, um, the shield and the face are likely to not protect the eyes from all splashes and sprays that are occurring out there. Um, so it looks like we're heading toward goggles mainly. Um, with the Department of Tennessee and the Shelby County websites, you know, these have their requirements listed on them and they even have more links uh, to get you to the CDC information as well as EPA uh, worksite. You know, one of the very common questions that we get has to do with PPE and uh, we're being asked, you know, what should um, our healthcare workers be wearing? So on this next slide, um, this is where the CDC's recommendations, they, they put this out in an FAQ, and so they tell you in a nutshell what they're expecting. But for you, think standard precautions. In other words, treat all individuals as though they are contagious. It's everything that we've been talking about. Um, the bottom line is, if you encounter patients, wear eye protection in addition to your face mask. And so this is just one part of your equation, and you'll need you'll need to think about um, about what you need to provide that safe environment for the employees, including yourself. So, you know, there's a local uh, MGMA group on the um, other side of Tennessee not the Memphis side, and they have a blog uh, that's going on right now, and they've been asking practices, um, you know, how are you managing through this pandemic? And I can tell you that no two practices are doing exactly the same thing. They're customizing what they need based on the spread of the virus in their community, 
um, the patients, the type of patients they see, the type of procedures that they're doing, and the resources that they have available, resources being number of employees that they have and the amount of the PPE that they have. So um, you have to decide what you're going to do to reduce risk in your facility. And you want to start with your local and state requirements, then see what um, more is needed based on OSHA requirements and CDC recommendations. Uh, mandate what you want from your employees. You do this by establishing office policies and then enforcing them without favoritism. Uh, then when you're confronted, um, you know, by physicians or employees and patients and visitors, um, you know, that don't want to adhere to your policies, you'll just be confident in saying to them that, well, you're not getting infected here. Um, but if you don't follow these rules and recommendations, then there, then you really are opening up your practice to spreading the virus. And that's something you just, you just don't want to do to damage your reputation um, and potentially kill somebody. Uh, you know, one practice manager said that her staff didn't want to wear masks because they're they're hot, and that's true, they are. And but her comment back to this individual was, "Well, if you don't like wearing a mask, you really won't like being on a ventilator." Now I know that's certainly not a fun thing to say to somebody, but you know, sometimes we need reminded of why we're doing this. We, we're getting all kinds of questions at SVMIC. Um, I just had one yesterday. Two of my employees are COVID positive. Do I have to do the contact tracing? Um, the health department is going to reach out to those employees, take care of that, but you need to be ready. And if you want to have a robust system, then you should have that available. Um, but help them if you can. Um, my employees think uh, they've been exposed to someone that has COVID. What should I do? My employees won't wear PPE. What should I do? My physicians won't wear PPE. What am I supposed to do? Patients are refusing to wear masks when we tell them that they have to. Well, now you have the the ordinances that are coming out from your section from your um, area, I'd say take those, um, highlight the areas that say that they're required to wear them and post them in your facility. If someone uh, can't wear a mask because of a medical reason, I encourage you to do the best you can to accommodate that person, you know, but don't embarrass them in any way. Um, but if somebody just flatly refuses to wear a mask and abide by your policies, then you need to let them know what the consequences are. So if it is a patient, then they'll need to reschedule or they'll have to seek treatment somewhere else, of course, unless it's an emergency. And if it is an employee, then he or she will just have to be told that you can't come to work because you're not going to jeopardize the lives of your other coworkers or your, or your patients. And of course, that brings up a whole nother can of worms that Sherry Smith's going to get into in just a second. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a quote from a manager that um, was, uh, I took it off the blog that she put up there uh, just this morning. And it says, I'm the cheerleader and voice of reason for everyone. Yet I find myself in the middle of a battleground between employees and providers who want to hide for 10 years, the ones who would run naked through Walmart licking cash registers, and the preachers who do not practice what they preach. Thankfully, we have each other to lean on during this time. So I encourage you to lean on each other, but to do it from a social distance. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry. Oh, thank you so much, Ann. And um, good afternoon to everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, even though it's, it's virtually and I'm actually presenting from my um, dirty kitchen, which is why I am not going to be, you're not going to be seeing me, but um, as, as Ann mentioned, I'm actually just going to talk on some of the most common HR questions and concerns that we have had during this COVID time. But before I start, you know, I really want to commend you leaders. I mean, you guys are truly the ones that are holding down the fort. And I love what Ann said about, you know, you guys have to be there together because, you know, just be there for each other. And, and unfortunately, Another big responsibility you guys have is your employees. I mean, your employees are looking to you, you know, for guidance during this time. And I know, you know, that can be just, just really frustrating and, and challenging, but I really commend all of you for the roles that you play. 
All right, so I am going to just start with just the key laws that could apply when you are dealing with employee requests and situations. So we're gonna start with the Families First Corona Response Act. You know, most of you now, you've heard of this law. It was passed in April and it includes two provisions. It has the emergency paid sick leave, which entitles eligible employees up to 80 hours of paid sick leave for specific purposes related to COVID. And then there's the emergency medical, family medical leave law. And this law entitles eligible employees paid protective leave for one specific reason. And that reason being that the employee is unable to work or telework because they need to care for a child because of school closing and place of care is closed again because of COVID reasons. So as of right now, and this could change because as Jackie stated, things are just changing rapidly. This law is temporary, expires at the end of the year. Um, so that as of right now, but we also want to think about um, the American Disability Act. It, this law includes the requirement for reasonable accommodations and non-discrimination based on disability. And, and this law could apply in many of the situations that you are countering, dis, encountering during this time. And then for those employers that fall under just the regular FMLA, you know, your obligations are still the same. None of that has, has changed at all. And then you, you want to make sure that you are, you know, updated with your state and local laws. And again, this is something that, that changes regularly. I mean, just for example, in the county that I live in, just last week, you know, our mayor issued, you know, the order of face protection in public places. Well, the counties around me have been under that mandate for quite some time. So it's just, it's important just to know what your, you know, what your current requirements are and that you and your employees are complying to those. And then, you don't want to forget about your own company policies. And I know you all are now implementing new policies. You're trying to get those in place, but you want to look back at these when you're dealing with situations. I mean, there's so many times that, that I have had managers or physicians just make immediate decisions on just, just the moment and they be completely di different from their written policies that they have in place and you probably know but we've seen it many times I and mean, this can come back to haunt you so comply with your own policies okay so employee screening so we we've we know that we can you know screen our employees we know that we can ask them if they're having COVID symptoms you know we know we can enforce temperature checks we can do the questionnaires i mean these things are now permissible under this current condition of this virus but but employers, you need to take in consideration all of the ADA requirements when you are screening and enforcing these policies. So when you are you know, asking your employees specific questions, you want to make sure that you are tailoring those questions to the symptoms that the CDC has put out when it comes to COVID. You don't want to just be asking you know, broad questions related to the employee's health and medical condition. And then, you know, as Anne mentioned, you know, under OSHA, employers are required to provide you know, a safe and working environment. So you've got to require, you've got to require the appropriate PPE to be worn and you've got to have those in place. And you're going to put, you know, safety measures in place and you're going to have to enforce those. And then one of the areas that I tend to see that, that we, we, you know, we tend to gloss over, and this seems to be now more so than, so than ever, just because we're busy and there's just so much going on, but, but training, you know, training our staff. So our employees, you know, obviously they need to know, they need to understand, you know, any new policies that you've put in place, but your supervisors need to know how to enforce those policies. And they need to know how to respond when someone raises a concern. So, for example, just and just mentioned, you know, employees not, you know, refusing to wear a mask. Well, you may have employees who who may be just stubborn, and 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 you do have policies in place, and you're going to enforce those, you know, individuals to wear a mask. But you may have an employee who who does have a medical 
underlying condition. And, and your supervisors need to know when concerns like this, you know, come up, that they need to know that they need to be handled, you know, cautiously and, and handled by either HR or, or, or you. Because it, you just you don't want to get you know into an, an ADA situation that that you cannot handle. That's that's just that that's difficult for you to address. So it, I'm going to like kind of like mention this a couple of times, but but the documentation is 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 key important throughout this process. You know, in human resource, it if. It, you know, whether an employee is, is concerned about wearing a mask or not, you know, conversations that you have with them, they need to be documented and, and you need to be documenting their concerns and, and conversations and having that information because, again, that is something that can come back to haunt you if you do not have that documentation and you do not act consistently as, you know, throughout, you know, these type processes. Okay, so so we know that you know we, we know that we can measure the body temperature, we can perform employee um, screening and so forth. But one thing that now we know is not permissible is antibody testing. Just last month, the EEOC came out and they said that employers cannot require employees to antibody testing. And, and the rationale to this was that they, the determination was based on the fact that CDC had said that we should not be relying on antibody testing when determining whether an employee can return to work or not. So again, these are things that, that may change throughout just learning more about the virus, but as of right now, that is where that stands. And, and I, I do encourage all of you to just continue to check on the EEOC, seek, uh, sorry, the EEOC link that I've provided here. They often give updates and they add questions and answers that can be really helpful just during situations that you're handling you know, with HR and your employees. Okay, so, so what about your employees at a higher risk? So according to the CDC, the following are considered to be at higher risk for severe illnesses if they contact COVID. So, you know, this includes, you know, quite a few medical conditions. And, and let's, let's say that you have an employee that approaches you and they express their concerns of not feeling comfortable, you know, coming and working in the office because they have asthma. And, and asthma is, you know, one of the possible higher risk underlying conditions. So, you know, not feeling comfortable and then addressing that with you, that can be, you know, that can be a point that, that, that can, that can be a, you know just a difficult situation to handle. So, so next slide, please. So in this type of situation, you you now you've you've got to like consider you now. I've got an employee who has expressed that you know they they're they're worried about coming to work because they have you know one of these individual medical conditions, and under the ADA, an employee whose disability puts them at a greater risk from COVID may request and be entitled to reasonable accommodations under the ADA. So at this point, it, when imp, an employee, you know, approaching you and expressing their concerns, you know, you as the employer, you, you've got to start that interactive process and communicate with them to find out specific concerns that they're having. You know, are there reasonable modifications that together that you can decide upon? You know, hopefully, you know, making those decisions and alleviating some of the employees' concerns, yet yet still allow them to perform their essential job functions. So, can we? Can they work from home? You know, can they, you know, work in a different area of the office? You know, whatever it might be, um, you know, trying to accommodate them the best that you can, and then, you know. Again, I'm going to kind of harp on, you know, documentation, documentation. So that is, again, one of the key necessary, you know, factors here that you need to be consistent with. You know, you not only want to document your conversations with your employees, but you want to document your offered options, your possible solutions, and you want to document it, and you can even request, you know, medical um, information or medical confirmation from their own providers. So, 
obviously any of this information, you know, is confidential. You do want to make sure this information is kept in an in the um, employee medical file versus their personal file. And then consult, you know, your HR legal professionals. You know, again, you don't want to get into a situation where an ADA is handled inappropriately and a file, you know, claim is filed against you. Okay, so, so what about the employee that refuses to come to work because of fear? You know, they, they're scared, you know, they, they don't, they're scared of the virus, uh, they, they're scared of ex possible exposures and maybe bringing something home to, you know, to their family. It, it, again, a, another very tough situation and usually, a, you know, hard, difficult, uneasy solution. But, you know, as the manager, you know, you want to make sure that you've done your due diligence. And again, you know, you know the OSHA regulations and you're complying with those. You know the ADA regulations and you're complying with those. And so it gets down to kind of exactly what you're going to do in this situation like you would with the higher risk employee. You know, you're going to, you know, get to the communication engagement process. And again, you know, find out, you know, what are their true fears? You know, is, is their fears, are, are they, you know, are, are they reasonable fears? You know, have they been addressed, you know, in, in your facilities? And it's just things that we've, we've got to be thinking about as we're dealing with these things. But once, once you have, you know, you have gone through the process and you have realized that the, this employee, that they have no medical underlying conditions, you, the employer has met, you know, all the um, necessary quality, you know, uh, qualifications as far as, you know, making sure the facility is, 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 you know, you know, you, you've enforced all the regulations and rules and it's a safe environment, but you've exhausted all the options with this employee, but they, they still can refuse, you know, to, re, to not return to work. And, and again, at this point, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult situation, but as the employer, you're the one who's got to be able to handle these. You know, do you have policies in place that you could allow the individual to take a leave of absence? But, but, Bottom line, the fear in itself, it's not a sufficient reason to not return to work. So, so you have reassured, you know, the safety measures in place, you have addressed all the employees' concerns, and you have possibly reached out to your HR legal counsel, and you've made numerous attempts, you know, to reach out to the employee to require them to return to work. So, when you've reached this point, you want to be very direct on this is the date that you are to return to work and communicate and let them know that by not returning to work, you know, that is, you can accept that as a volunteer resignation. And, and typically in this type of situation, an employee would not be eligible for unemployment and the Department of Labor is encouraging employers to report those refusals to come back to work. And, and again, 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 you know, documentation is going to be your most important tool and guide here throughout this particular process, especially because we are seeing that the, there are being, there are increased, you know, claims that are being filed by employees and your best defense when the EEOC, you know, comes knocking on your door is how accurate and how complete your medical records are, sorry, your records or documentation is. All right, so last, I just want to just touch on, you know, your employee personal travel. You know, how are you handling your employees that are returning from vacation hotspots? And again, just a, a, another difficult question and not really a clear solution. And, and now we're seeing just, you know, looking at this map, you know, Tennessee is now one of the poorly controlled, you know, states and, and, and it's starting to be considered one of the hotspots. But, but, 
you can make the decision and you can put some policies in place to how to handle employees that are, are traveling in and out of these type areas. You, know, you can require, you know, to quarantine them for a period and uh, we, CDC recommendation is 14 days, but we know that can be difficult because employers, you know, not having their employees and they're, they're out for a period of time can cause a lot of, of havoc. So there's something you might want to consider is, is trying to balance the risk of your employees traveling by having them complete a risk assessment survey, which is based on CDC guidelines. And CDC has a risk assessment on their website. And by answering questions and, you know, about the travel, you know, whatever, they, they travel by car or plane, or was it cruise ship, or they go to Miami, or was it they travel internationally, you know, based on the answers to these questions can determine the risk of possible exposures and maybe the way that you would want to handle that particular employee. So at a minimum, though, I would recommend that you, you consider, you know, heightening your protocols for two weeks for an individual that's traveling to one of the hotspots. And, and whether that be, you know, COVID testing, extra added temperature checks, whatever that might be for, for your place, you know, for your practice, you, you, your main priority is just to minimize the risk and to protect your employees and the patients to the best of your ability. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Michael, who's going to be talking about telemedicine. Thank you, Sherry, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you guys virtually. Uh, when the pandemic started, the telemedicine rules and regulations changed what seemed like daily, if not weekly. And not only that, you guys were trying to keep up with all of the other issues. We talked about HR and OSHA issues. Um, Gretchen will talk about some operational issues and it was just very challenging to keep up with all of that information. It was kind of like drinking water from a water hose. Uh, it's just only so much you could absorb. I mean, that's part of the reason why we have four presenters on today's presentation. It's just very difficult for one person to keep up with all of the information. So today I'm just going to review the current state of telemedicine. Uh, this shows telemedicine util utilization. This is the result findings from an UpDoc survey completed in mid-May. Uh, I uh, provide telemedicine presentations over the last several years, and one of the questions I ask in the beginning is how many people had utilized telemedicine, and I usually only had a few hands um, in, the, in the audience. This survey shows much more adoption, which I'm sure is not a surprise for anyone. Telemedicine is not new. Uh, I actually had a telemedicine visit a little over four years ago for an eye infection. I was a new patient and I visited with a physician um, in Knoxville. I was, I was based in Nashville. My insurance didn't cover it, but I was able to pay $50 as a self-pay visit and I was satisfied uh, with the service. I thought telemedicine adoption would expand more quickly. However, it seems as if, if there is slow adoption in communication and documentation, technology and healthcare, physicians have been frustrated with EHRs and patient por portals. And there's also a segment of the patient base that's not technologically savvy. And COVID was the catalyst that moved the dial. And now we'll have to see if it's here to stay. It shows 65% of patients who like telehealth prefer the convenience. Uh, in a June MGMA optimizing telehealth research and analysis report, it was quoted that time is the new currency. Patients really don't want to wait anymore. And that's probably reflected from all of the other conveniences that we have in our society. We can do our online banking and shopping, and we have so many apps on our phone that allow things to be more convenient. We still go to banks and we still go to stores. I'm sure moving forward, we will have telemedicine and healthcare in some form or fashion like we do in other industries. We show that 63% of patients who like telehealth don't wanna be exposed to other sick patients. You know, we're now in, in mid-July and we're approaching the flu season this fall. It doesn't look like we are, based on Gretchen's report earlier, it doesn't look like there's uh, any downward trend. It, it's, it seems to be increasing at this time and that's gonna be compounded with the flu. And then what I thought the, was most interesting was 49% of patients who plan to use telehealth post COVID want provider of choice. And that was really the challenge of telemedicine pre COVID is that payers didn't cover it when the patient was at home and they did not have provider of choice. They either had to elect as a self pay or use some other options. 
Next slide, please. Uh, history prior to the emergency period, Medicare had a qualified site and rural area restriction. Qualified site, they required the patient to be in a physician office or hospital, and they also required the patient to be in a, what's called a healthcare professional shortage area. Now, this worked well if you had a patient, so let's say a patient has a stroke and they go to a rural hospital, and that hospital doesn't have a neurologist on staff, they could use telemedicine to communicate with a physician at an urban hospital and provide that life-saving intervention, but it wasn't very practical for everyday use. Commercial payers also had a qualified site restriction. There was a payment parity law passed in Tennessee, but it still allowed payers the flexibility to have that site restriction. And so again, it didn't cover patients when they were at home. Over the last few years, we've seen payers become more flexible in their telemedicine policies. Although it wasn't open access, they had agreements with corporate telemedicine vendors. There's several, uh, MD Live, American Well, Doctor on Demand, and Teladoc are just a few of the major players right now. And they would contract with them for their members. And in many cases, they were able to have reduced copays for utilizing that service, but it wasn't open access. We saw some self-insured plans, uh, corporations that had self-insured uh, insurance. They also had these agreements with corporate telemedicine vendors for their employees, and they found value in having telemedicine as an option because there is a cost associated with employees being away from the office. So I think the commercial payer and the self-insured trend was a, a, a pilot study to try to evaluate the cost of implementing telemedicine. On the other side, many payers thought that if they expanded access, that we would see higher utilization in healthcare services and increased costs. And so that was kind of the dynamic that we were facing at the time. And because of those options, we had a few private practice group that, groups that implemented telemedicine as a self-pay service. Now you have to look at your contracts to do that, but many contracts, it's, it's a non-covered. And so you could provide that service to the patient as a self-pay. I had a lot of questions from physicians that didn't understand and why everyone was using telemedicine, but how come they couldn't use it in their office? And uh, I think that highlights a few of those reasons. Next slide. The current state of telemedicine, Blue Cross actually was announced that they are providing in-network telehealth services permanently. Uh, I think they were one of the first major Blue Cross plans in, in the states that implemented that policy. Uh, United Health said they're extending it through 930, Cigna 731, Aetna 930. Uh, we recently received guidance that 10 Care is extending it through August the 29th, and Humana has from uh, extending through December 31st. Now, what's the challenging part of this is you're trying to keep up with all of the dates for these different pairs, and that can be overwhelming at times. There's also state licensure issues. You guys are in Memphis, and I know you may have some patients in Arkansas or Mississippi. Many states have granted a temporary waiver for the emergency period. Don't just assume that you can see patients in another state without applying for a temporary waiver. Uh, there is the Federation of State Medical Boards websites, and they list all of the states. And they have guidance on if you need to complete an emergency waiver uh, application. Many states don't have any fees associated with that. It may have a limited time frame, but uh, I would encourage you guys to look at that side if you see patients outside of Tennessee or where the physician is licensed. There's also issues with, with DEA. Uh, normally, the DEA has what's called the, the Ryan Hyatt Act, which requires one in-person evaluation before prescribing controlled substances. However, that was waived during the emergency period. The Ryan Hyatt Act originally came out of the internet pharmacies where patients could go online and request controlled substances, those mail order controlled substances that you saw, but it kind of extended over into telemedicine after that. Um, the DEA, there was a law passed that required the DEA to implement a special registration by October 29th of 19, but that never happened. And so we're still under the Ryan Hyde Act of one person, uh, one in-person evaluation, but it's waived during the emergency period. Uh, malpractice is another issue you need to consider. Uh, contact your carrier to see if, if you're seeing patients outside of your 
a covered state, then check with your carrier to make sure that you're covered in the state where the patient is located. And then we also have HIPAA um, issues to consider as well. And the HHS has implemented enforcement discretion in applications like FaceTime and Skype. Uh, the key is that they have to be one-to-one. -one. It can it's cannot be a, a public facing program like a group chat where multiple people can view the conversation. So the future of telemedicine, question mark. I, I created this a couple weeks ago and uh, many states continue to see a rise in COVID cases and that's probably more evident this week than last week. Uh, we have the problem of compounded with the flu approaching this fall. There are some promising hopes for a vaccine in the near future, but I don't think we have have that yet. And so we'll have to see kind of how that plays out. We still see payer flexibility providing uh, coverage at this time. And then we also have the state regulations to consider and, and most states are allowing patients to be treated at home uh, before COVID. And we have the infrastructure in place. So like I mentioned, I had a, a new patient visit in Tennessee uh, the, so the rules were in place. It was more a matter of, of payer reimbursement. This is a summary of telemedicine services. There's telehealth visits and it includes interactive audio visual and audio only codes. I've attached a link that you can reference to look at all the codes and they, it's a spreadsheet and it also shows codes that are covered by phone only. The office visit codes uh, 99211, 99201 to 99215 are not covered by audio only. Uh, there's some consulting and education codes that are included by audio only, and I'll talk about the phone calls in a minute. But it is available for new and established patients. Uh, there's also an e-visit code. This was implemented in January of 2019. It was actually before the COVID, and Medicare doesn't consider this tele telemedicine services. It was just an additional code that was released. It's a brief five to 10 minute conversation. Uh, G0212 is, uh, could be a phone call. Uh, it's, it's, it's interactive. The G2010 is asynchronous or it could be, you know, taking a picture and sending it to a physician at a later point in time. There are some restrictions around it. It, it cannot be related to an office visit seven days prior and 24 hours after the code. Uh, it's originally designed for established patients, but for the COVID emergency, you can do it on new and established patients. It also has to be performed by the billing provider. So by your physician or nurse practitioner, you can't have a nurse or medical assistant document the five to 10 minute conversation and then bill it under the physician unless the physician, the billing provider is actually doing the work. A similar codes are the virtual check-in codes. This is communication between a patient and provider via the portal. And this was released in January of 2020. Again, this was before COVID. Uh, the 99421 to 99423 codes are for physicians and advanced practitioners. The G201, G2061 to G2063 is, um, is for occupational therapists, physical therapists, and psychiatrists. And again, that's originally for established patients, but it's allowed for new and established during the emergency. And then the last to be approved was phone calls. And that probably created the most confusion for everyone. It's audio only, it's based on time. The 99441 to 443 are for physicians and advanced practitioners. The 98966 to 68 are for physical therapists, occupational therapists, and psychiatrist. And it, you can do that on new and established patients as well. Place of service and modifier can be a little confusing. Uh, it, it very it differs between Medicare and commercial payers. Uh, Medicare originally came out and said to bill an O2 place of service with a 95 modifier and it had lower reimbursement. And the premise behind that was that the physician is util utilizing telemedicine. They're not in the office, not consuming as many resources. And so they should have lower reimbursement. However, they came out a couple weeks later and said, we understand that there is the cost associated with telemedicine. You still have to use staff time, scheduling and following up, providing prescriptions. 
those types of things. So use the place of service that you would normally provide the visit, which would be 11 place of service with the 95 modifier and it has higher reimbursement. I think the reimbursement is about $20 higher for non-facility versus facility billing. So I'd encourage you guys to use the non-facility billing. The e-visit and the virtual check-in codes, uh, again, use the place of service you normally would would use. Uh, it has no modifier associated with that. And that's, it's not on that list of the Medicare covered telehealth services. Um, and so just want to make sure you guys are, are aware of that. But the phone calls originally were not considered telemedicine, but they added them to that list. And so they say to use 11 place of service and a non 95 modifier. That, that has been a little confusing because there hasn't been a lot of guidance on that, on that 95 modifier. But the research I've seen says if you follow the list of codes that are published on the list of Medicare covered codes, those should have a 95 modifier attached. With the commercial, that's probably the most confusing. You probably have to look at this by pair. Check to see if you need to use an O2 place of service or an 11 place of service. Um, also check with the Medicare Advantage plans and remember to look at the end dates on these. I don't, I, I, I think we're going to continue to see uh, currently the Medicare uh, emergency period expires on July the 25th. Last time they came out five days prior to the expiration and said they're extending it. We're expecting that they will extend it this time as well. I've seen some guidance that said they are planning on that, but it hasn't been released yet. All right. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Gretchen to talk about business operations. Thanks, Michael. I just want to let everybody know you've made it through three fourths of the presentation. So we're coming into the final stretch here. <laughs> I know uh, so many Zoom calls were on that it, it, you need to know when you're going to be able to take a break. So in this section of business operations, we're really going to talk about um, focusing on your people. I know Sherry touched on HR, um, but this is going to be much more of a strategy focus on caring for your people. More, now more than ever, staying flexible is really the key. And it's harder for us to do because everything's chaotic. And when things are chaotic, we want to reach for things that we can control, not only us, but also our employees and our patients. So as a leader in your organization, I really encourage you to strive to be the person and the place that flexes for people. You know, the government's at all levels keep changing the plans, the schools are changing their plans, and it really has everybody on edge. And so your actions now could have a long-term reputational impact and demonstrating empathy and flexibility, prioritizing your workers' mental health, and creating a psychological safety for your patients and employees can have a meaningful impact, not only on their current experience, but also on how you're seeing going forward people will remember how you treat them. So we're gonna be focusing on people for the next couple of slides. First, let's talk about how to focus on patients. At the most basic level, the more that you can take just a moment at the beginning of every interaction with a patient to humanize the encounter, the better the person's gonna experience it. While it may seem intuitive or obvious to treat your patients as people, all too often, especially right now with all that we have going on in our heads, um, we can be focused on charting or finding PPE, but instead if we can be intentional in each patient encounter, starting from the very beginning, it's likely that the patient feels vulnerable, they're uncertain, they may be anxious or irritated as they sit there, perhaps they're worried about catching COVID, waiting for you to enter the room. So after greeting the patient and anyone that's accompanying them, if you can take a seat and ensure that you're either at or below their eye level. And this is, you know, for all of your staff that are encountering the patient, encouraging them, physicians, nurses, um, even for the uh, front office staff to be able to greet them in this way. Trying to get on, on eye level sort of um, prevents this sort of sense of hierarchy and values who they are. You're not looking down on the patient. You're helping to put them at ease and contribute to this atmosphere of trust. You can encourage your practitioners in the first five minutes to say, is there anything I need to know about you? Just a really general open-ended question at the beginning of the appointment underscores the importance of connecting with 
the patient. It also ensures that we're truly listening. As you get further into the conversation, you can be more distracted about um, what kind of follow-up that you need to provide. But if you can do it early on in the appointment then and ask an open-ended question, you're letting them know that you're interested and you're empathetic throughout, throughout the rest of the appointment. Of course, listening and relationship building don't start after the first five minutes. Oh gosh, hang on one second, I jumped ahead there. Okay. They don't start in the uh, end in the first five minutes uh, or even at the exam room door. Strong relationships are essential by building on effective communication across all the touch points through all stages of your patient's journey. So take a look at your environment of trust and responsiveness across the entire patient experience from including all the way through billing and collecting payments. And right now that's hard as many people are out of work and uh, are struggling to figure out how they can pay the rent. Um, they may need a little bit more flexibility and compassion with regard to payments too. Another way to focus on pay patients is to give them as much information about your new protocols as possible. Not only is this a good way to reach out and have another connection with them to remind them that you're there, but it's also letting them know how seriously you're taking the virus. So those patients that are really anxious about catching it and, and maybe uh, prolonging or putting off uh, care because they're afraid of coming in, the more you reassure them about the protocols that you have in place, the more comfortable they are to, to feel like coming in. And then they also know what to expect. So when they get there, even if something, um, you know, you're not throwing any uh, loopholes in, in the, their experience. It just is exactly what they expect when they show up. And then again, giving them just enough, you another reason to reach out and remind them that you're still there. You know, out of sight can mean out of mind. So any kind of email or text or phone call from your office is another way to let them know that you're still there and that you care. Ultimately in healthcare, we, likely feel external pressures influencing how we practice and attend to our patients, but that doesn't have to mean that we can't shape uh, how evolution occurs in our own practices. So as leaders, along with your entire office staff, you can commit to ensure that human relationships stay at the forefront. It doesn't have to be a transformational change, rather it's something you can achieve with each interaction and each encounter, starting with those first five minutes. So next we wanna focus on staff. Um, right now we're seeing a huge increase in anxiety and depression disorders. So you can see what the CDC had kind of established a baseline in last year and then a poll this year, uh, both anxiety and depression have started to skyrocket. So whether you've remained uh, open throughout quarantine or you've just begun to reopen, you, you and your staff are likely feeling stress out. Working parents uh, already had a lot to juggle before schools closed and the first time, and now they've been trying to find childcare for their children for four months, and now a lot of schools are not reopening or they're reopening in some non-traditional way that's almost more stressful as parents try to figure out if it's one day a week or one week on and two weeks off, or, I mean, you know, it's just um, really precarious. Uh, so we encourage you to really think about how to manage the business and take care of your staff at the same time. One way that you can do that is to prepare to notice changes in your staff and address them in a compassionate way. You know, I think um, in, in the old, Old way of living, pre-COVID, we found that more structure and more consistency, this is how we've always done it and this is our policy, uh, really worked and, and having that consistency worked. But what we're really encouraging employers to do now is recognize that this is not like anything we've ever confronted before, but as an employer and nothing our employees have encountered before either. And so, um, you know, thinking about ways to, recognize when your typical high performers may be having more difficulty concentrating. They may also be more moody. When you notice performance lagging, instead of really calling them on the carpet and addressing the performance issue, try reaching out with compassion to understand what's going on for them. 
a listening ear goes a long way right now for many people who feel like they're barely holding it all together. When staff share their concerns with you about their stress, one suggestion that you can share is to encourage more mindfulness. And mindfulness comes in many forms, but the primary function is to slow the swir swirling thoughts going a million miles an hour. For meditation or prayer to coloring and blowing bubbles, really everything, anything that takes the focus off of the perseverating thoughts is a good option. Some people enjoy watching birds at a bird feeder in the backyard. Others enjoy going for a walk in the woods. Another great form of mindfulness to bring up is listening to calming music. In fact, I learned recently in a webinar that I attended talking about uh, staff stress, the most calming song that science has documented is called Weightless by Marconi Union. According to Mind Lab International, who did a study on this, listening to the song Weightless induces a 65% reduction in anxiety and a 35% reduction in usual physiological resting rates. So I think sometimes mindfulness uh, gets more of a, a guru-centered philosophy, but it really doesn't have to be. There are lots of ways to be more mindful. Another leadership you can stay, step you can take revolves around flexing other processes. For example, are performance assessments really needed this year? If they're only going to cause a lot of extra work for you and stress for your employees, you might just consider skipping it this year. Yes, there are important ways to measure and communicate performance through performance evaluations, but this year it just might not be necessary. So it's an example of something to just rethink whether or not it really works for you right now. And finally, celebrate the small things. For example, we asked some practice managers for ideas they've been using to motivate your staff, and I wanted to share some of those ideas with you. One said that uh, she's doing meetings on the green outside where everybody brings a chair, they bring their own chair, and she orders a box lunch, and they go outside and have lunch outside together for a staff meeting. Just trying to break up the monotony, get a little fresh air for everybody, and maybe even a little social time. Another practice manager said we closed the office one afternoon and had lunch and s'mores at one of the doctor's river houses. So maintaining social distance, of course, and this was back when their schedules were very light. But again, we're talking about as, as things sort of open and reopen and close and, and reclose, you may have some periods coming up where your um, volume decreases. And so you can take advantage of that by doing an outing with your staff. Uh, again, socially distancing and, and being out in nature, uh, we'll be able to take really good advantage of that this fall when it cools off a little bit. It's too hot right now, but before it gets too cold. Another practice manager suggested um, closing the office when they're finished with patients and letting people go home. So just keeping one front office person and one clinical person to rotate uh, to answer phones and assist patients. And because everybody loves to be able to go home early, especially on Friday. Uh, I loved this idea. She bought ice cream and put a thank you note on it at the ice uh, on the ice cream that just said, thanks for showing up, despite the fact you may be concerned and scared and want to stay home. I appreciate the care that you provide to our patients, and I'm glad you're here. So that's sort of a clever way to provide ice cream and, and not just plot the ice cream down, but really, you know, include the thank you note, too. Uh, lastly, um, one practice manager bought donuts one day and then the note said, I do not know what we would do without you. So again, just to kind of ways to celebrate the small things because right now we all need to, to celebrate as much as we can. So next in um, focusing on the community is again about communication. So really maximizing your email and social media platforms to help everybody know what you're doing. Again, it's the, kind of the twofold process where not only are you reaching out and you're having another connection with them so they remember that you're there and remember that you're open, but they also can feel comforted by the protocols that you're putting in place. So it's a good reason to reach out and reassure them that you're there and you're working to keep them safe. Through your social media platforms, if any of you are doing blogs or um, podcasts, 
if you could involve local public health officials in coming on and, and talking about, um, you know, what the protocols are that day, that week, <laughs> as they're changing so often, that's a good way to reach out. If you can participate in small health checks or small health fairs, uh, that might be a way to connect with your community. Again, wearing masks and social distancing, but being able to pr provide some health checks because we do know that people are really putting off some regular health care because of their concerns. And then lastly, I want to move over to yourself. So we take care of our staff and we take care of our patients. But how are we taking care of ourselves? So as many of these ideas, mindfulness and um, giving yourself some flexibility and cutting yourself some slack on policies is really an important thing to do right now. We, we are in unprecedented times and that means that sometimes um, you need to, to adjust how you're caring for yourself too. So I encourage you to put yourself higher on your own to-do list. Jackie, I'm going to take it back to you for questions and then also our contact information. Thank you very much, Gretchen, and thanks to all the panelists. We have had a few questions and a, a, two of those questions have been answered. And I know that Sherry is prepared to answer this question, which says, if an employee has gone on vacation to a hotspot or epicenter, can they be required to stay home for 14 days? And does that leave fall under the Families First Act? Uh, Sherry, are you? Yes, hey, hey yes, okay. Jackie. Um, I mean, employers, obviously, you can have policies in place to, um, to, to, to have employees quarantine after traveling to hotspots. But following under first corona's response um it would have to fall under the cdc mandate which if an individual traveled you know internationally you know, the cdc does mandate that that individual be quarantined for 14 days and that is one of the qualifying reasons for um being paid under the ffcra but um as far as just traveling from state to state there are no federal and state god mandates in Tennessee on that, but as the employer, you know, you can have, you know, return to work plans and policies on make a decision if that is something that you want them to do after returning from just, you know, state, state travels. Okay, thank you. And we had an um, OSHA question, do OSHA requirements apply to those staff members that are working from home? And is it the employer's responsibility for uh, ergonomics? And Anne answered this question. Anne, do you have any further comments? Um, uh, no, but I'm happy to go into more detail if anybody needs it. Um, sure, sure. Uh, and Anne's contact information is at, is at the end of the presentation. Anne's answer says that it's the employer's responsibility to ensure staff while working at home does not get hurt because of job tasks. Therefore, it may be necessary for the employer to provide an ergonomic solution. And Anne is our OSHA expert. As I mentioned, her contact information, email and phone number is at the end of the presentation. In interest of time, I'll go ahead and read through uh, the question that was asked for Michael, which he's answered. And it was related to the waiving of state licensure. Is licensure requirement temporary list, temporarily lifted for Mississippi, Arkansas, and Alabama? Arkansas, Mississippi, and Alabama have temporary license applications. So you'll need to file an application. It looks like they're still active. And Michael attached a link under the Q&A answered questions where you can find information for each state. Um, which is the fsmb.org website. With that, we'll, in the interest of time, we'll conclude. And I want to reemphasize a point Sherry made and encourage you all to review your uh, not only federal guidelines, but state and local guidelines and recommendations. As with any disaster, the impact and recovery is local to, to the specific situation. And what is right for one may not be right for another practice in the next county or even down the street. 
And at the end of the day, you have to do what's right for your patients and your staff. Uh, we wish you all much success and good health. And we are here as a resource uh, always for our physicians and policyholders in the Mid-South MGMA. Jackie, I think there's another question that came in. Okay. Let me go back to open. Uh, just for clarification, if it is safe, if it is just state travel and the office policy requires an employee to quarantine, does that employee have to use it? their accrued sick leave, Sherry? And I'm actually, um actually respond to that right now because a lot of that does apply to their your written policies you can't force your employees to take any accrued paid sick leave unless you have a you know if you have a policy stating that you have you know you're if you're you're going you know your employees are going to quarantine you know after travel you know and that that's that's going to be a call based on policies that you may have in place so it's not that's not going to be just a, a yes or no you know forcing them to to use their own sick leave you, you you cannot just force them to use it okay thank you sherry and eric and clint will turn it back over to you all at this time thank you jackie um and michael sherry gretchen uh thank you all for the um, information today great a discussion. Uh, definitely, I'm glad that this is being recorded, so it's available for review and follow up in the future. And uh, anyone who was not able to make it today, I definitely let your peers know that this will be available on the uh, local MGMA website uh, here shortly. And I, again, just another thank you to SVMIC. Uh, again, they are a platinum sponsor for the MGMA and we appreciate all they do to support our doctors and our practices and especially during times like these so thank you all appreciate everyone's attendance today any questions or follow-up feel free to reach out to any of us and the contacts and the speakers today and we look forward to talking again uh, hopefully next month so take care be safe thank you thank you